Uh, the message this morning is entitled, Dissatisfied. Dissatisfied. Now, I just want you just to, just to paint a picture for you. Imagine you are a student and you put a lot of effort or you place a lot of effort in your academic life, in your studies, and you perform well throughout your high school. You do well, you do excellent, you get honors, and then you're hoping to get into the, the, the university of your dreams. And then after you've applied to be, and you're waiting for acceptance letters, that letter from that university never arrives dissatisfied. Or let's say another situation where you are in a job and you've been working your butt off a whole lot, you've been working overtime, and everything about your time, everything has been dedicated, every ounce of your energy has been focused in your job, hoping for a promotion, hoping to land in that true dream job that you had expected, and it never arrives dissatisfied. Or let's say, relationally speaking, there is someone that has caught your attention and has not only caught your eyes, but has also caught your heart. And you're doing everything to woo this person and to, to, to express this person that you have a deep affection for them and your love is just boiling or spilling over for them, only to find out that it's only one-sided love and the person does not share the same thoughts or affections towards you. Dissatisfied. We experience dissatisfaction multiple times in our lives. And for some, we experience dissatisfaction multiple times in a single day. And the only way that we can escape from being dissatisfied is to die. But if you're going to live, dissatisfaction happens but how do we deal with it? And how do we come to the point where we can truly be satisfied in this world? Can it happen? Can we experience it? And I believe that we can. I believe there's something more. And I'd like to share with you a message entitled Dissatisfied, coming from a relatively familiar story that many people might be familiar with, found in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. But before we get into this message, I would like us to be able to bow once more and to invite God's presence and ask him to lead us in prayer. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we are honored to be here. The children's story, Brother Malcolm shared about being thankful. And we should be thankful that we have an opportunity to have the word of God, to be taught by you and of your Holy Spirit, to be able to have the opportunity to share your word with our words and through our actions. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, of which that you came and died for me, you died for us all, and that you had us on your mind. Lord, we are privileged to be so honored by you to be called children of God. So at this time, as the word is being shared, remove me and may your word be heard. May not the person our individuals simply be seen in this story, in this message, but may above all Christ be uplifted so that we can turn to you and find all that we need. For this is our prayer. We invite your Holy Spirit to speak to both me and those who hear the sounds of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dissatisfied. So our story begins with Jesus entering into a city called Jericho. And we pick up this story right here in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. And it reads, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Now, before we get too far in this message, I want to encourage you. This may be a story that most of you have heard before, and you've heard it multiple times as a little child. And I'm encouraging you not to write it off and say, well, I've heard this story multiple times. I know everything I know about the story. I can uh, turn off this video right now, and I can do something else. 
I want to encourage you that there's something here for each one of us. And I want you to pray to listen intently and carefully because there's something here that God wants to share with you. The Bible says that Jesus entered into Jericho and then introduces the man here that we're focusing on, Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. It says about three things about this man simply in, in one verse. It says his name, it gives us his profession or his title, and thirdly, it gives us his social economic uh, level or status. Okay, so let, let's move backwards. Okay, first of all, his social economic status. Zacchaeus is a rich man, and that was probably an understatement. He was probably more than just a rich man. He was probably a very wealthy man, and he had just about everything he ever could ever dream for or dream of. Everything he could dream of having, it was probably his. He was not a man in want, as many of us here may experience, wherever you may be, you probably have had financial wants. You probably had lackings and shortcomings because you just did not have enough money. Your salary is just not enough, but this was not Zacchaeus' problem. He was well off and he was wealthy, he was rich. This is his economic status. But then let's go to his title or his profession. He was a chief tax collector. So he was not just an ordinary uh, tax collector, the person who would typically be a local Jew who would be collecting money from people. He was the manager. He was a CEO. He was the overseer of the people, the local people who were taking money. So he never had to deal with the local people. But the people saw him with his nice clothing on, and they knew that he was the big boss. He was the man who was in touch with the Romans to make sure that things were going as they should. He was in close contact with the Romans, and a good Jew would never want to be in touch with a Roman who was considered to be their conqueror. So Zacchaeus had alignment. He had communication. He had relationships with people whom a typical Jew would never want to have a friendly association with. But this was Zacchaeus. So we see his socioeconomic status, he was very well off, very well to do, and he got there because he was not just a tax collector, but he was the manager, the, the chief tax collector. But then it tells us his name, and names mean something in the Bible. And so his name is Zacchaeus. And so the word or the name Zacchaeus actually means, listen to this, it means pure, justified. Pure or justified. Now, his parents must, must have had a dream when they gave him this name. They said, we want this man to be pure in a world that's impure. We want him to be just in a world where people are not living justly. We want him to be stand above the crowd. We want him to be an example to people. And so they gave him the name Zacchaeus, saying he's going to be a pure and he's going to be a just man. But up until this time in his life, being a chief tax collector, he seems to be everything but pure and just. He has disappointed the dreams of his parents. And every time he hears his name and every time someone calls him by name, he is reminded that he is everything but what he was called to do. He is everything but what he was called to become. Zacchaeus is a disappointment. But let's continue in the story in verse 3. And before we get there in verse 3, let's just let's go back a little bit. Because in the Jewish culture, there's reading from uh, history that a tax collector would not have even been welcomed in a synagogue or a temple. So if you are a tax collector, moreover a chief tax collector, if you walk into church one day on Sabbath, and you're ready to worship, you might be blocked off at the door as if there's only 50 people to get into the church and say, you're 51, and you're 51 every Sabbath. Sorry, Zacchaeus, you can't make it. So he was barred from worshiping. He was barred from going to the temple. And a tax collector's money was not good enough to bring an offer to God. They were that much hated by their own people because he gained his money through a means of fraud, of theft, of greed, and it was unlawful. 
So, so, so far in the story, Zacchaeus has probably disappointed his parents. So far in the story, Zacchaeus is not on the best of terms with his own people, religiously speaking, and those who are not even religious but secular. But he has every materialistic thing that one could ever dream or hope for. And as we continue with our story, verse 3, and he sought to see He sought to see who Jesus was. He sought to see who Jesus was. It makes me wonder why. Was he dissatisfied? Was there something he was longing for that he could not obtain? The actor who I believe is a Canadian, Jim Carrey, he said these words. I hope everyone or everybody could get rich and famous and will have everything they ever dreamed of so they will know that it's not the answer. Could it be that Zacchaeus had everything the world could give him, everything the world could offer, and yet he realized that it still did not contain the answers that he was longing for in life, of belongingness, of being satisfied, of value, of worth. So the story says he wanted to see who Jesus was. Not just hear what Jesus had to say, not just to simply to see what Jesus was doing, but this man had a change in his life and for some reason he wanted to see who Jesus was. Now, true enough, Zacchaeus was not able to go into the temple. He was not able to go into synagogue, so he probably didn't hear Jesus in person sharing his wonderful messages. But the words of Jesus spread far and wide, far and wide beyond the area or the country of Israel. It spread out to Tyre and, and, and Sidon, and, and it went all over the place. People heard about Jesus, and they heard about his miraculous healings. They, they heard of his great teachings, the great rabbi. But Zacchaeus also probably heard of the things that Jesus did, such as that he would make a follower of his who had, were, were former tax collector, the tax collector Matthew Levi. And, and this was an unusual thing for a tax, or should I say a rabbi to do, to make a tax collector his follower. That was extremely odd. But there was something about this Jesus that stood out and that seemed to have given hope and a desire and an interest in this mind of Zacchaeus and he wanted to see who this man was for himself. So we know in Desire of Ages, uh, we're told these things. And I'm just gonna go to the, the bold print there. It says, yet the wealthy custom off, customs officer was not altogether the hardened man of the world that he seemed. Beneath the appearance of worldliness and pride was a heart susceptible to divine influences. Zacchaeus had heard of Jesus. The report of one who had borne himself with kindness and courtesy toward the prescribed classes had spread far and wide, and this chief of the publicans was awakening a longing for a better life. He wanted something more. And I know that when we go through life, there are times in our lives where we feel like, is this all there is? After I've worked so hard to get to this particular point in my life, after I've worked so hard to get with this person in my life, after I've worked so hard to be able to move in this place in my life, is this all that there is? I don't seem to be satisfied. And so Zacchaeus, after he's reached a place in his life, he's still dissatisfied, and yet hearing about Jesus and hearing his words, something develops within his heart, and a love is rekindled, hope is developed, and he believes that there's something can be better, and that better can be offered with Jesus. So let's continue. We're continually told that Zacchaeus, he grew up in the church. His mom probably raised him trying to help him memorize the scriptures. He knew the scriptures. He was convicted that his practice was wrong. Now hearing the words reported that have come from the great teacher, he felt that he was a sinner 
in the sight of God. Yet, what he had heard of Jesus kindled hope in his heart. He was both convicted, he was a sinner, but he had a hope in Jesus Christ. And that's what the church is about. We give a message that not only convicts people of their sin, bringing the word of God, but we also bring right beside that there is hope in the word of God, friends. So we have two messages, but the hope is no good if you're not convicted, you're a sinner. And, and to convict people of their sin and not give hope leads to desperation and discouragement. We have to bring both messages, and this is what Jesus brought in his life and in his teachings. So Zacchaeus was convicted, but he had hope that was rekindled. Maybe Zacchaeus thought that maybe I might live out, to live out my name. Maybe there is an opportunity that I can live the pure life that my soul desires, that I can be at peace with my own heart. I can be at peace with how I live my life. Maybe I can live justified life before my God and before others. Zacchaeus' hope was starting to return, and he wanted to do everything he could to make it happen. But we're told later on in this paragraph that the, the, the fruit of trying to make your life better, the fruit of trying to... to make things right, or it's not easy all the time. And as he's struggling, Jesus comes on the scene and he enters into Jericho at the right time. So he wants to see Jesus for himself. And the Bible says, don't taste for someone else. Taste and see for yourself that the Lord is good. And so he desired to see Jesus for himself. Continuing, and as he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. He was of short stature. Zacchaeus did his best to see Jesus, and he was trying to make his way through the crowd. Uh, but there's, a, of course, everywhere Jesus went, everyone wanted to see him because he had performed a great miracle. He had just healed a man who was blind, and now they're praising God and celebrating. That story is in Luke chapter 18. So you have the blind man who's now cured of his blindness, and people are celebrating and praising the Lord. So you have this large crowd, and they're listening to Jesus as he talks and he shares, as he's walking, making his way through Jericho. And Zacchaeus says, I want in. I want this opportunity. I want to see Jesus. And Jesus is going to die like the next week. He's, he's marching his way to Jerusalem here. So as the crowd is going, Zacchaeus says, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. But people are like looking around like, who is this? Zacchaeus? Why are you here? Look, look over here. Look, look, look at that. But they're saying to themselves, who has Zacchaeus ever helped? Who is, has he ever gone out of the way to support in some way? Why am I going to give Zacchaeus my position? Forget him. Let him wait. Who cares if he has to see Jesus? Or some are probably saying that Jesus doesn't care about it. There's nothing that Jesus can do for him. Zacchaeus is too far gone. He's too far lost. He is a sinner and the chief of them. So no one wants to let Zacchaeus in. And so they're thinking about themselves. I'm going to be able to follow Jesus. So we have Jesus followers, but the Jesus followers are the people who are keeping other people from seeing Jesus. Mercy. I pray that we as a church will never be the Jesus followers in this story, the crowd, who will be hindering people from seeing Jesus. Sometimes we as a church can do this. Sometimes we are so caught up in our thing, in our crowd, that we're unconscious of the people behind us who are trying to make their way inside to be there. Sometimes there's people who want to get inside, but they don't look like the crowd. They don't look like us. Zacchaeus didn't fit in. He was short. He was small. He was very wealthy. He didn't have the best history. He didn't have the best uh, a profession. And we look at people it's like, well, look at their profession. You know, they're a rapper. And I don't know if you're in the right place. You come off with cut off jeans. I don't know if you're in the right place. Maybe the place you're looking for is just around a corner. So we have to be very careful not to judge people by their appearance, by their profession, by their title, by their social economic group, where they were born and which community. People, if they're brought into the place of God, then God has brought them to the place of God. And so we have to be very welcoming. But this crowd, though they are following Jesus, 
they are the ones who are hindering Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus. But let me tell you something. Don't let the crowd slow you down and stop you from seeing Jesus. When the burden gets so bad and when dis dissatisfaction gets so deep and so strangling, you need to keep fighting forward to what you need. There will be roadblocks. There will be setbacks in the way of trying to see Jesus, but we mustn't let this stop us. Zacchaeus was also a small man, and we don't know exactly how small he was, but he had limitations based upon DNA, things that he was out of his control. And sometimes we feel the same way in our lives. Well, I'm just not bright enough. I'm not just smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I, don't, I didn't grow up in the right family. It's not in me to be able to follow Jesus. I can't do much for him. And we must be aware that these things ought not be setbacks for us to follow Jesus. But does Zacchaeus allow these things to keep him from following Jesus? Does he allow these things to stop him from seeing Jesus the way that he wants to see him? Is he dissatisfied with his life enough to keep pressing forward despite the obstacles and challenges because what he's reaching for is possibly better than what he already has. Well, let's continue. Moving over this past real quickly, but the crowds of our lives could be many things, friends. And you might have to ask yourself that too. If you are pursuing Jesus also to meet him and to see him, that crowd could be many things in your life. That could be music. That could be certain movies that you watch. That can be social media networks and sites. That can be any kind of form of entertainment that is forming a block or a wall from you to meet Jesus. That could be academics making an idol out of your grades or sports. That can just be simply a love of comfort and sleep. Fear of other people's opinion is huge, and we're going to see that in this story. It can be our work, our career, and the way that people see us in that light. It could be even as close to us as friends and as family of calling us names and turning away from us. If we say, I want to see Jesus, I'm no longer a part of your family. There are many ways that people allow crowds to slow them down from seeing Jesus. It could be hypocritical Christians and critical Christians, popularity, and it goes on. The list can go on. You can fill in a blank where that may be for you. But whatever it is that will stop you or slow you down from getting a chance to see Jesus or whatever it is that causes you to be disinterested or to see Jesus in such a way that you are no longer interested or passionate about getting to know him, these things may need to be reconsidered and let go. But Zacchaeus, he is determined because Zacchaeus understands his soul's condition. He is empty. He is void. And he longs that for something more. And after hearing Jesus' words, he believes that there's something more to life than the way he has lived his life up until now. Now let me just deviate for a second. I remember watching some news year, years and years ago of a man and he lived up to be 100 years old and everyone was wondering, what is your secret of longevity? What is your secret of longevity to be at least 100 years old? And one thing the man said is that for the past dec decades, even until now, I smoke several cigarettes every day. That is a secret. And every person who does a little reading and research and understand the impact of smoke and cigarettes on the body would know that that cannot be the secret. And for multiple millions of people all the time, they die and their lives are shortened by decades because of smoke. So I say, what if that man had let go of those cigarettes? Could he have lived to be 120? Could life have been better? Is it possible that maybe the last several years of his life he was in and out of the hospital, but had he not smoked and adopted a healthier lifestyle that he could have been able to excuse all those times in a hospital and he could have been free to live his life to the full? Might I say this? is that even if you don't feel like you're empty or bankrupt in your soul, might I say, is it possible that life can be better? And if it's possible that life can be better, 
if it's possible that there is something more than what we have currently right now, would you want it? Would you want it? And how far would you go in order to obtain it? Zacchaeus was determined to obtain what he was lacking in his heart, in his life. So the Bible says he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, Zacchaeus was doing something that was entirely uncommon and unheard of in his time. It was countercultural for a wealthy man and a rich man and an, a, a man of at least some age to run and to climb a tree. Now, that might not be a thing for us today, but that guy asked, when was the last time you as an adult have climbed a tree in public? And not because your little children persuaded you to. Zacchaeus, well to do, he begins to run and people are observing him. Whoa, what is this man doing? He's running. Only children run. Only athletes run. What is he doing running? And then he runs. He runs ahead and he determines where Jesus is going to walk. And then he climbs up a tree and I'm sure he's probably hoping that no one sees me. No one sees, please don't let anybody see Big Zacchaeus up in a tree with his nice clothes and shoes on. Oh, it's going to be so embarrassing. But Zacchaeus, at this point in time, he becomes so hungry and so dissatisfied with where he is. And he has such a hope that things can be better that he doesn't care so much what people are thinking because he has to see who Jesus is who can possibly transform his life. So he runs and he climbs and he's there up in the tree. When we really want something, there's no stopping us. When there's something you really need, we ought not be obtained from grasping and reaching for it. Uh, I have it here said, too often people allow what others think to control our lives or their lives. We ought not let other people's opinions and attitudes or superficial acceptance of others direct our life decisions. Especially when we know what must be done, we must take courage to do it. So Zacchaeus, he made a decision. Embarrassment, to look weird, to look like a fool, to look crazy, I accept it. All because the thing that I reach for appears to be something better and something more. Could Jesus be something more for you? Could Jesus offer something more? for you. Years before I went to Korea, lived there and worked there, and there's a place called the Jimjibang. And this is a somewhat interesting story, uh, but there's a Jimjibang and it's a modern day spa, it's a lovely place. It's a place where people go and just spend time. They can go through a, a hot tubs and, and they're all various temperature and sometimes you have a mineral bathtub and you have a salt, tub, a salt bath. They might even have a green tea tub. And they have all these different places. It's remarkable. That part is just, it's gender separated. So only males are there, only females are somewhere else because it's, it's separated because it's nude area. And there's other areas where you can go through uh, 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 different things like, uh, I'm trying to lose my mind or losing my thoughts here. But, but there are different rooms where you can just go there and it's just really a relaxing place to be. And so I went, when I went to Korea, uh, a bathtub was not very common. Showers are very common, but not bathtub. And I'm long for taking a bath, for soaking. And, uh, and after nearly a year in Korea, or after at least several months, the desire for a bath became greater and greater and greater and greater. So, Brother Daniel, I decided I was going to go to the Jimjibang and test it out. The big problem was I was the only person that was not a Korean. I was the only person with this color, with this body shape and this body design and figure. And I knew that when I would go there, I would be as a museum. And it made me feel highly uncomfortable and very conscious of myself to thought that I would have to remove my clothing to go to this wonderful spa. What do I do? The embarrassment, being uh, on, on spotlight, 
What do I do? And I stood there for what it felt like 15 minutes. Do I go inside? Do I not? Do I go inside? Do I not? And the thought came to mind, but I want to get in a bath. I want my body to soak in water. I want the therapeutic, enjoyable feeling of being in a bath. And so eventually, I was able to muster up the courage. It says, come what may, no matter how many eyeballs are looking at me, I'm going to go. And I went. And I did have eyeballs looking at me. But I had a most enjoyable time in my bath. And that wasn't the first. It was one out of many more. It was a big jump to not care what other people were thinking because the desire and the hunger for a bath became greater than my concern of what other people's opinions were. Zacchaeus came to a point of his life. He no longer cared what people thought. He didn't care that it might look funny with him following Jesus. He didn't care that it would look funny with him going to a service or a church and worshiping on a Sabbath day, seven day Sabbath day. He didn't care what other people thought if he stopped listening to certain music and he adopted other music and other videos instead. He didn't care what people thought if his social friend network was a little different or if his choice of language was a little different. Those things started to care less to him and he started to care more about a life potential of being really satisfied by meeting this person named Jesus. So we continue on in our story. He ran. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, he said. Quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Now, before we get too far in the story and to the exciting part of this, I want to take us to some more historical highlights and understandings of the time of these people here. Now, Jesus, he walked through the city of Jericho. And culturally, the people would have welcomed Jesus. Great rabbi, great teacher, miracle worker. They would have been saying, Rabbi! Master, please come to my home. I have prepared a humble meal. It's not very great, but, but, but we'll be honored to have you, a rabbi, in our home today. Please come and dine with our family. Just like Abraham welcomed those three strangers, two angels and God who was walking, and Abraham welcomed them and had a meal prepared for them and sat down and enjoyed time conversing with them, people were the same way at this time, same culture. And so they would welcome Jesus. Jesus, please come to my home. And Jesus said, thank you so much. But I have to deny your request. I have an appointment today. OK, OK. All right. He's important. So he has some more important person to go to, right? More important thing to do. And so another person comes to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, I have a very nice meal. I have a lovely feast. The table is laid. It's prepared. And we just need you to come to our home today. Please come on to our home, Jesus. Jesus says, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. But I have to pass. But thank you so much. I have an appointment today. And another person comes. And another person comes. And another family comes. And then finally, one of the priests come. In, and this city of Jericho had thousands of priests. It was a priest Mecca. And so a priest comes to Jesus looking all, you know, proud and good about himself. And he knows he's something special. And everyone knows his name. He says, Rabbi, uh, we'd be happy to have you at our house today, too. Uh, we have a humble house. Not really. But uh, we'll be happy to have you at our home. Please come and dine with me today. Everyone's saying, okay, that's the important person. And he wants, he wants to go to his house because Jesus believes in going to important people's homes. And Jesus has to tell the, the priest, I'm sorry. I thank you for your invitation and your offer, but I have an appointment today. And so Jesus continues on and everyone's wondering, well, why is Jesus not visiting anyone's home? Why is he saying no to all the opportunities? And then he gets, and he gets to the point where he sees Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I want to go to your house. That's the appointment Jesus had. And Jesus makes things worse because all those people came to Jesus and said, Master, can you come to our house today? 
and it was the job of the host to invite the guest, never the guest to invite the host. But Jesus, he goes out of social norms again, and he says, as a guest, he says, Zacchaeus, do you mind if I go to your house today? I need to go to your house today. It's very important. Zacchaeus wants to look for Jesus. He's up on a tree. He's out on a limb. He's looking embarrassing because he wants to see who Jesus is. And Jesus knows his desire. Jesus sees his actions. And he says, I know that he's not the best man. I know he has a history. I know he's made some mistakes. But I can tell through his actions that he wants something more. We have to read the actions of the people. If they're in the church, no matter how they look, no matter how they're dressed, it means that they're there for a reason. Their hearts and their lives are telling you that they're there for a reason. If they're coming to you at your workplace, if they're talking to you at school and it says, what is this God thing you talk about? Why do you go to church on a Saturday? Why do you eat like that? Why don't you listen to, why do you listen to, watch that Christian music all the time, a Christian, Christian program? What is all that stuff about? And they're asking, God is working on their hearts. And we need to be receptive and have eyes open like Jesus did and to see that he's out on a limb because he is hungry and thirsty for something more that this world cannot satisfy him with. So Jesus, he sees him out on a limb and Jesus, he speaks words that Zacchaeus only wishes he can ask. Zacchaeus wish he can say, Master, come to my house today. I have a house. I have food. I have things prepared. Please come to my house. But Zacchaeus, as the Bible says, he is a notorious sinner. He is the worst person in the city. He is the chief of sinners. He has a history. He has baggage. He has problems. He has sin in his life. He's done things that he is shameful of. He feels that he's undeserving. He has shamed his parents. He's not lived a pure life. He is definitely not a just person. He knows he's not worthy of anything else in his life. He's not worthy of the church folk. He, he's not worthy to go to church, the synagogue, or the temple. And he's been overlooked and outrated by everyone else. And the last person he expects to say these words is Jesus. But Jesus calls him by name and says, I must go to your house. He says the words that Zacchaeus wished he could say, but he doesn't have the confidence to ask him and to have the confidence to know that he would say yes. Jesus says, I want to visit you today. Come on down. Come on down. And the Bible says that in great excitement and joy, Zacchaeus stumbles down the tree. And verse 7, but the people were displeased. They said, he has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Zacchaeus probably had never had anyone to visit his home. He probably had a mansion, multiple rooms, wishing that he could have guests outside of other tax collectors. Not a good rabbi who was not concerned about being contaminated by bad people. But Jesus says, I want to visit you. But when the crowd, the Jesus followers hear this, they grumble. They're unhappy. They say, Jesus has lost his mind. They identify, they make a bad word, say some bad words about Zacchaeus. Yeah, he's a notorious sinner. He's a terrible man, Jesus. But then the insults are not just with Zacchaeus. They are reflected onto Jesus. Look at it carefully. Verse 7, but the people were displeased. He, referring to who? Jesus. He, Jesus, has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They're saying, Jesus, you have lost your mind. You have gone crazy. You have gone cuckoo. How is it that you, a good man, can go to his house, a bad man's house? How is it that you can invite yourself to be with him? How can you even associate yourself to this kind of a guy, this kind of a person. And that's the thing I love about my Jesus is that no matter what our lives have been, no matter the mistakes that we have made, and Lord knows I have made my share, he says, I still want to visit your house today. I want to come and dine. I want to associate with you. I want to connect with you. And I know you by name. I know other people look at you and they say, you're just a tax collector. You're, you're a chief sinner. You're, you're, you're a professional thief by calling. 
and they have titles and, 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 and things that they call as derogatory words. And people don't even know our names anymore. But Jesus, he still knows Zacchaeus. And he says, Zacchaeus, he says, my pure man, my pure man, my justified man, I want you to come down. I want to visit your house today. I want to restore you to what you're supposed to be. I want to show you that you can be pure. I want to show you that you can be justified. I want to show you that you can live a different life. I want to show you that you can be a different person. And so Jesus, he takes, he takes the insult. Jesus takes on Zacchaeus' criticism. He doesn't try to please the crowd or conform to their own thinking. He is blamed because of the costly love he has given to an unworthy person. He is blamed, criticized, judged, insulted, but Jesus happily accepts them all in order to reach out to, this love, to love this one dissatisfied sinner who needed help. That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. Jesus could have pleased the crowd and caused Zacchaeus to be lost. But he was thinking about Zacchaeus. But was he not caring about the people? Did he not care about the crowd? Well, this is going to be answered in a moment. Jesus took on his insults. Continue me. So Zacchaeus came down out the tree. And verse 8. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people of their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. I give half my wealth to the poor. I will give them back four times as much, those who have cheated. This is beautiful, friends. This is beautiful. So what is this telling me? It tells me a couple of things. I want you to use your imagination with the story for a moment. Zacchaeus is a very rich man. He's a manager of the other rich people. Zacchaeus, by all means, he's probably a multimillionaire. His net worth is pretty up there. And when Zacchaeus says, I give half of my wealth to the poor, he is inviting, he is initiating this. Jesus has not coerced him. Jesus has not pressured him. This is of Zacchaeus' his own heart. He wants to sacrifice half of his goods and his wealth to others. Why? Why does he do this? It's not to be saved. See, what's happened is, and, and matter of fact, I have just a quote here about that. Uh, what happens is that Zacchaeus is shown... Zacchaeus receives costly love and is thereby empowered and motivated to offer costly love to others. This is from Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes, Kenneth Bailey. Once again, it says Zacchaeus receives costly love and is thereby empowered and motivated to offer costly love to others. You see, Jesus, he was willing to associate with Zacchaeus. And the love that Jesus showed to reach out to Zacchaeus without concern of what others were saying was such a great love for Zacchaeus that Zacchaeus was willing to express a great love in distributing his wealth and goods to the poor. When we have contact, when we have a change of life in our heart, it doesn't only affect our minds and our thoughts and our thinking, but it also affects our hands and our pockets and our accounts and what we do. Zacchaeus has had a true heartfelt change. You shall know them by their fruits, the Bible says. So Zacchaeus, let's say he's, his net worth, he's about $50 million. He's about $50 million. Zacchaeus says, half of my goods I give to poor. Now he says, $25 million I'm giving away. Imagine that. Imagine East Hastings Street. And if East Hastings Street in the surrounding area is, is, is the town of Jer Jericho. All of a sudden, you walk down East Hastings Street and like, half the people are gone. Where are they? You look at a place where people used to live in the streets, cardboard boxes, like, what happened to everyone? People are doing better now. You look at where the homes were, and the homes were falling apart, and the roofs, what happened? they're doing a lot better now. You look at people who were sick, 
for years. And they were sick for years because they didn't have enough money to provide for their condition and to take care of their health. And all of a sudden, they're taken care of. Everybody's wondering what phenomenal thing has happened in Jericho. What has happened? <clears throat> um, you know the guy that you're grumbling about, the, the, that terrible sinner that Jesus spent time with? Yeah, yeah, Zacchaeus. Yeah, that, that guy, Zacchaeus. Well, he gave half of his, his wealth and his money for all the people here, and it, it actually changed the society. Uh, the poor were a lot better off, and, and the hungry, they were taken care of. And, and the naked, well, they had clothes. And, 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 and just something amazing happened because he gave half of his goods to the poor and to the people. And then he said, I'm going to go above and beyond that. If there's anyone I've stolen anything from, I'm going to make sure I, I return them and make restitution. I'm going to make things right. And because Jesus took care of this one man who no one, and should I say, who everyone had forgotten on. This one man who the church had forgotten about. This one man that the Romans could do nothing with. This one man who seemed to be the last person ever to be saved or be a Christian or to be made a follower of Jesus. This last person who no one thought of, Jesus said, I need to take the time to help this one person who everyone else has forgotten. This one person who everyone has written off saying, they can never amount to anything. Even God himself can't help him. Jesus said, that one person I need to reach. And because he chose that one person, that one person in turn would be the evidence of the, the larger majority, the crowd, that Jesus was mighty to save. Jack Caius made the impact in his city that maybe no one else could have because of the change in his life. Zacchaeus, as the master tax collector, chief tax collector, he would make sure that all the other tax collectors who he was managing and working for, working with, that they were doing honest build, uh, dealings. Jericho, I wouldn't be surprised if it was one of the most honest places you can ever travel where you would not be cheated out of your money while Zacchaeus was still chief tax collector. It had turned around because Zacchaeus wanted to be an honest person in all his dealings. If he was chief tax collector, he was going to make sure that people did what was right because he was serious about God, serious about following the principles of the scriptures. Jericho became a different place. And everyone who used to grumble about Zacchaeus and grumbled about Jesus reaching out to Zacchaeus now became praisers. Thank Jesus that he reached out to Zacchaeus. And now the crowd followers of Jesus, they probably became real followers of Jesus, all because of Zacchaeus. When you can reach one, one person for Jesus, who knows the ripple effect that that can have on so many more others if we don't judge them by their appearance, judge them by their past, or judge them by any means, but give them a chance to call them by their name and to show self-sacrificial love, it can change someone's life. In closing, Verse 9 and 10, it says, Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. Those who are lost. Zacchaeus was now a part of the family of God again. He was hopeful that he can receive uh, eternal life and to be a part of the, the blessings of the people of Israel. Jesus would tell all the people of Israel, Zacchaeus is one of us. You thought he wasn't one of us, but he is. Accept him, welcome him, he belongs. And Zacchaeus, by his free sacrifice of all his goods, shows to all people that money, possessions, really did not satisfy. But what really satisfied was a relationship, an encounter with Jesus. Friends, I want to make an appeal with you today or for you today. 
And it's a short one. A short one. There are many things about this story that are phenomenal and amazing. But one thing I want to say is that Zacchaeus was wholly dissatisfied with the things of this world. You can gain the whole world and still lose your soul. Zacchaeus was not satisfied because this world was never created to satisfy the longings of our hearts. Only God, only our creator can fill in that missing void in our lives. Only a, a, a face-to-face, a, a walking relationship with him can do that. And I thank God that Zacchaeus came to a point in his life where he knew that he needed him. And I want to speak to you. Some of you out there, you realize that you are completely bankrupt. Emotionally, socially, personally, spiritually, you're bankrupt. And you're dissatisfied with the current state of your life. Or you realize that your life can be a whole lot better, a whole lot different than it is today. You realize that you have not been living up to your name. You have not been living up to Zacchaeus. You have not been living up to being a pure person, a just person. And you know that your life is, if it can be unveiled and uncovered what's really going on, then you will be ashamed. And you're saying today, I want the satisfaction that Zacchaeus found in Jesus. I realize that he loves me and he will go above and beyond. He doesn't care what others say and do. He will leave heaven, come down to earth amongst his creatures. He will be insulted, criticized, blamed, tortured, suffering, and eventually die because he's thinking about you. If that's you and you're saying today, Lord, I want to be satisfied in a relationship with you. I have been running I've been doing my other things. I've been trying to fill my life with everything else I could think of, with money, with a job, with a person, with a husband, a wife, with my family, with just entertainment. And I've realized that this is just not satisfying and I want more. And you have hope in your heart. I'm asking you today, tell it to the Lord. Lord, fill my heart, satisfy my, my needs and my desires. I want a relationship with you. Or you might say, Lord, I want to renew my relationship with you. I've made a decision before, but I want to recommit myself to you today. I invite you to do that right now, to make that recommitment today or to make that first commitment today. Lord, come into my heart, satisfy the longings of everything I have and all that I have. Satisfy me, please. And my second appeal for others out there, it might be the same person. you realize that you want to be more like Jesus and that there are other Zacchaeuses out there. There are other people out there who are waiting for you to come and talk to, for you to come and be their friend, for you to come and show them some sacrificial love, some kind of kindness, some friendship, some compassion. And you know who that person is, but maybe you have walked past that person, you've ruled that person out, you said that person cannot be reached, they're beyond being reachable, and, and, and I, I can't do it. They don't, they don't look like they're ready. And you realize today that that ought not be the right spirit or that shouldn't be the way that you look at them. And God has put them on your mind and you realize that you need to do something special for that person. You don't need to give up on that person. You need to pray for that person. You need to reach out to them and you need to do something because that can be Zacchaeus that can change his or her community and the world. And he's saying, Lord, that person that you've brought to my mind, I'm going to first start today, right now, I'm going to start praying for them. And I'm going to pray for myself that I have the heart to keep pursuing them as Jesus pursued Zacchaeus. And I'm not going to care about what other people think about me pursuing that person. I'm not going to care about what people say about me. All I know is that Jesus impressed my heart to pray for that person and to show love for that person. Come what may, however they respond to it, I'm going to do it. And you're saying, yes, Lord. I know that person, and I want to show that same love of Jesus Christ to that person today. If that's you, I invite you to pray and ask the Lord to help you, starting right now, and give him uh, free permission to do that. And God will bless you. I'm going to invite you to pray with me at this time. Let's pray, family. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for hearing our word today. I thank you for giving us a word today from your word, the Bible, to share. Lord, we see that you are a most amazing God. And your love for us is beyond comparison. 
Lord, you do know us by our name. People may know us by our title. People will know us by our, 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 our reputation. People know us by the things that we do. But you know us from inside out. And you know what we can be. And you are the only one who can help us to become the person that we can be and should be. Lord, take control of our hearts. We surrender ourselves over to you. And with this amazing love of Jesus Christ, I pray that you help that love that you have to be living in our hearts so that we can also share this kind of love with others. At a time when we are barred from churches, when we cannot worship together, when a pl in time and place when we are isolated from one another, as Zacchaeus was, Lord, we need creative ways. We need you to show us new ways and, and, and practical ways and simple ways how to reach people, how to love people. So show us, Lord, and honor the, the prayers of each person who hears my voice as each one who's different ones who have made commitments to you and accepted these appeals. I pray that you will honor their appeals or honor their honor their requests, hear their requests and bless each one. For this is our prayer. We thank you in Jesus name. Amen.